Hare Krishna. So, thank you for coming today evening. And today I will speak on the topic of dealing with people intelligently. And I will speak this based on Ramayana and I will speak broadly three points. And after each point we will have a pause where you can reflect and suggest some, say some, repeat some point which you found striking. And if you have some questions, you can ask that. And at the end also we will have some question answers. So the three points I will speak will be, uh, first is intelligence means to place things in the most constructive context. The second point I will talk is from the Ramayana about Lord Ram's first lesson in warfare, in actual live warfare. And a third will be that how we can increase our intelligence in our relationships. So let's look at it, the first point. I was a few months ago in America in Connecticut and I, there I was doing a seminar for the, on the, for the Connecticut government on uh, mental health and spirituality. So, so the many of the people who were there, they're talking about how they started, they had their experiences with mental health and how they dealt with it. So there was one girl, she was telling that she was studying in a good university and she was also working uh, to earn some money by the way, she was waiting on tables. And once she was carrying some water to, for a client and the glass slipped from her hand and it cracked and it split and she says that one incident shook me so much. She said that if I can't even carry a glass of water, what am I going to do with my life? She says that pushed me into depression. So now I was responding. So here. Now what happened is that we may say so many, how many of us have slipped a glass of water from our hands? No. Almost everyone, isn't it? <laughs> no, how many of us have gone into depression because of that? <laughs> no one. So what is happening over here? See, when we get depressed, we take the smallest of events and place and draw the biggest of meanings from them. Oh, I can't even carry a glass of water. That means I am useless. So basically the same event, uh, same incident can be placed in different contexts. Say for example now, if after this program, we wanted to have a photo of the program. So now we could frame it in different ways. One could be if you would frame it to focus on the speaker, who are the speaker? The second could be to frame it on the audience to show how much the audience was receptive. How uh, maybe frame it on a few members in the audience to see how whether they were interested or not. Could put it bigger to show how many people were there in the program. You could make an even bigger picture to see how big the space is so that how many people can fit in the program. So just as the same incident can be framed visually in different frames. So similarly, the same incident in our mind with our we can frame it in different ways. So for example, if the glass slips from my hand, I could say, maybe I had not wiped the glass before picking it up. That's why it slipped off. Or maybe you know, somebody suddenly talked something and because of that my attention went off. Or maybe it was that the glass was too heavy and my fingers are weak. It could be that somebody had spilled water on the floor and I slipped in on that water. Or it could be somebody suddenly called me or yelled at me and that caused my distraction. So now. Each of these is a framing. So a, a, in, now depending on how we, which framing we put it in, okay, next time I carry water, I should wipe the glass before that. Or next time I, I should make sure that I can't, don't carry too big a glass of water or whatever. So whenever we frame anything, now most of the times we do this kind of framing naturally. Say for example now, if some of you start feeling it's a little too warm here, then or some of you start feeling it's too co a little cold over here. Now you may decide, okay, is it maybe too many people here? That's why it's become warm, or maybe the temperature is a little too high or a little too low, or maybe I have I need to wear take off some 
outer cloth or I mean to put on outer cloth. So what happens is the same thing you could pay that okay this is some practical solution somebody might say from that same thing if say, somebody has recently come to Australia and their two minds should I stay in Australia or not they start feeling a little too warm or too cold and they may say hey, in Australia does not suit me I do not want to stay here. Now whether that is a valid or a useful context to put it in that is something which each one has to decide. So Srila Prabhupada in the Bhagavad Gita in the 10th chapter explains intelligence means to place things to see things in their proper perspective to see things in their proper perspective. Now what do you mean by proper? Proper means that which is the most constructive. Now it could be also that okay maybe the weather of Australia is not suited for me but right now is that what is constructive for me? If we do not put things in the proper perspective then we start drawing wrong inferences from it. Wrong in the sense of inferences which have unwanted effects on us. Like because of just a glass of water slipping from someone's hand then we start thinking oh I am worthless. That is an unwarranted inference. It is an unhealthy inference. So in every situation when we face the situation in what context we place that situation that is important. Say if somebody decides to give their first public speaking talk and they go on the stage and then they get something which is one of the most common fears of people. What is that? Stage fright and they get stage fright and it's freeze over there and then somehow they are not able to do anything very very well over there and they come back and they think oh, public speaking is not for me I am not made to be a public speaker and after that never in their life they go and speak in public on the other hand somebody might say okay maybe this is the first time it's not just on the stage anything I do first time first time I went into the water for swimming I froze at that time also. First time I got into a plane, that time also I, I was trembling. So when I do anything first time, that is when I, 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 I feel fearful, but I do it a few times, then I become normal. So if you have the right context, then we can do something constructive. We can respond in a more positive way. <coughs> or someone might decide that, okay, I froze because I thought I will remember everything and I will speak everything. But if sometimes I can't remember something, let me have some notes with me. So even if I forget, I can just read from the, read from the notes and explain. So everything that happens, we need to place it in a proper context. And for us, getting this context, getting this framing right is the essential function of intelligence. In the 18th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna talks first from 18.20 to 22 about knowledge and 18.30 to 32 he talks about intelligence. Now the difference between the two is knowledge is more in terms of perception and intelligence is more in terms of action. So when he is talking about say for example intelligence so in knowledge in 18.22 he says sarva bhuteshu yenaikam bhavam avyayam ikshate avibhaktam vibhakteshu tajjyanam vidhisatvikam he says that one can see that there are so many people, they are all different but underlying their diversity is their spirituality. Everyone has a similar spiritual essence. So the capacity to see the commonality amidst diversity that is perception or knowledge in goodness. And then Krishna talks about buddhi. Uh, the, in the mode of goodness in Sattva Guna, proper buddhi and he says that dharma <coughs> he talks pravrittim cha ka, nivrittim cha karya karye bhaya bhaye bandham moksham cha yavetti buddhi sapartha satviki in 18.30 he says pravrittim cha nivrittim cha what is to be done and what is not to be done karya karye bhaya bhaye that in what action I should have fear about doing it and in what action I should have no fear about doing it. Bandham moksham chaya vetti. Bandham moksha means what action will lead to bondage and what action will lead to liberation. 
the intelligence that understand this that intelligence krishna says is in the mode of goodness buddhi sa partha satviki so intelligence is in terms of being able to discern what course of action i should follow and when we just see an action okay i can look at the action do i like doing it i don't like doing it uh, is this is this going to something i am afraid of something i should be afraid of i should not be afraid of is this going to lead to something good or something bad in future so one is in terms of our own liking or not liking about it it is another is in terms of the social prohibition or approval about that and third is in terms of the consequence of that so all of these are framings say in, say if we consider drinking alcoholism say now in some cultures drinking is considered to be just a normal thing if not just normal uh, there is a western author who has written a book called the taste of wine proves that god loves you <laughs> the idea is wine is so delicious and you know how could there be something so delicious unless there is a god who loved you so now here what the people say okay it tastes so good but what about its results it can make you intoxicated it can cause all kinds of embarrass all kinds of embarrassing or distressing consequences we say no 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 okay people say drink but don't become drunk it's it's fine it's like saying if go to a high mountain peak look down the mountain peak but don't fall down well if you're looking down if just a gust of strong wind comes you may fall down also so basically the point i'm making talking here is not about drinking it's simply an example to analyze how different things could be placed in different context contexts somebody could look at the taste and say oh this is so good i want it somebody could look at the consequence and say no this is i don't want to get involved in this so basically intelligence means to place things in the most constructive context this was the first point any comments or questions okay so my comments i basically mean say after this class you go and you want to talk with someone else any point you would like carry home you would want to share with someone so if you share it now when we do hearing traditionally there were three stages to hearing there is shravan smaran and nidhyasan shravan is hearing smaran is remembering nidhyasan is contemplating contemplating so that we can apply in our lives so that we can apply in our day to day contexts so when we think about reflecting what are we trying to do okay which point relates with me which point strikes me so you think of it this way then you can apply it in uh, you can there's a better chance to apply it so let's go to the second point now that is an uh, lord ram's first lesson in warfare now ram is himself the supreme lord at the same time when he descends to the world he acts like a human being of course like an ideal human being in many ways uh, but at the same time the standards of idealness may be different in different contexts so we have to understand the context to understand how a particular action may be ideal but so when he is a ideal human being that means he is also a ideal student as he learns and grows so the first test of martial skills for lord ram comes when he is still a teenager does anyone know against whom ram, ram fought for the first time tadaga yes so when ram was still a teenager at that time vishwamitra came to ashwath maharaj's palace and now vishwamitra his name was the friend of the world but actually everybody lived in fear of him of course he was kind but he could get angry and when you get angry people he could curse so when he came dashrath maharaj was very uh, humble offering respects and asking how can i serve you and then when he said that i want ram to come with me so that he can protect my sacrifices from the demons who are uh, 
uh, troubling the and desecrating the sacrifice. So the Shrit Maharaj said, I'll come with my whole army. Mm -hmm. He says, No. It is Aram specifically who should come with. And then he said, the Shrit Maharaj is a little apprehensive. He says, Who are these demons? He said, They are the demons associated with Ravan. Oh. The Shrit Maharaj became horrified. He said, Even I with my full army will not be able to stop him. Ravan is so powerful. And he begged, you know, please don't take Ram. So the Vishwamitra immediately became angry. He said that you had promised that you will serve me and now you are going back on your word. So his anger would come suddenly. And seeing his anger, everybody became apprehensive. And Vashishta immediately came to Dashrath Maharaj and took him aside and told him that Vishwamitra is such a powerful sage that he, if he wants, he can finish off the demons himself. But he is taking Ram to glorify him. And he will give him the mantras, he will give him the weapons by which he will be protected. So have no fear. Dashrath Maharaj still was apprehensive, but he reluctantly agreed. And along with Ram, Lakshman was inseparable. So Lakshman went with him. In some ways, this is the first exile, or the first going into the forest. And this some ways foreshadows what will happen in the Ramayana later. In both the, in both the epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharat, the two main protagonists, the main, main characters, they go into the forest twice. The Pandavas also go first time. Actually, the Pandavas are born in the forest. They come back, but they go again when they are sent to the Varanavart and the house is set on fire. And there also, at the end of it, what happens? Through the forest, through the wilderness, there is a union. They win the hand of Dro they win the hand of Draupadi, and a very powerful alliance is formed. So there are parallels between the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. In fact, that is a very fascinating subject. I have a whole class about twenty-three parallels between the two epics, and of course, each parallel has some has some something significantly different also. But anyway. So what happens is that here Ram goes to the forest and Lakshman goes with him and while they are in the forest at that time so Vishwamitra starts telling him that there is this very powerful demoness Adaka, and Adaka, she is terrorizing the whole forest and then Ram naturally asks who is she? How did she become so powerful? So he says that she says that actually she was a yaksha earlier. Now there are different levels in the universe and there are different kinds of beings. So these yakshas, although they are the servants of Kuvera, who is a Devta, yakshas sometimes behave in a very arrogant and ungodly way. So once his Tataka's uh, husband, he came to curse, he, he came to attack the sage Agastya. And at that time, Agastya, just with chanting mantra, felled him. And Tataka heard that her husband had been killed. She got so angry, she came to kill Agastya. And Agastya saw that, that it is not just one yaksha in this family who is arrogant and aggressive. So, because when Tataka came along with her, who came? Her son also with it, Subahu and with the Maricha was also there. So, they also came and at that time, uh, Agastya just gave one curse. He says, all of you, although being Yakshas are behaving like demons. So, become demons become demons. Yam yam vapis maran bhavam tajatyante kalevaram tam tam evaiti kaunteya sadatat bhava bhavitaha. In the Bhagavad Gita, in 8.6 Krishna says, bhava bhavitaha. Tad bhava bhavita. Bhava refers to disposition. And bhavitaha refers to destination. What kind of disposition we have right now, that kind of destination we'll get in the future. So, we are constantly shaping our future by shaping our mind. If our mind becomes attached to Krishna, we will attain Krishna. If our mind 
is attached to worldly things, we will stay on in the world attached to the worldly things again and again. So, because they were behaving in ungodly ways, they became ungodly creatures, they became demons. And as Vishwamitra was walking, at that time they saw that the whole forest which had been green with birds chirping and with some squirrels wandering along, full of life. Suddenly that forest became barren, silent, almost deserted. And Ram intuited that this must be because of the fear of Tataka. And Vishwamitra turned to him and says, we have come to her area now. Now you should finish her reign of terror. So Ram picked up his bow and twanged it. As soon as he twanged it, that is like a call for challenge. And the twang was so, so loud, so resonant, so provocative that immediately Tardaka, she, she was in her cave, she charged out and said, who has come to challenge her? And she just, she saw from a distance, the princess, she was amazed, you know, how can these, these kids challenge me? And she started charging towards them. And when she started charging, she created like a storm around her. And Ram, he had twanged the bow and he was looking, where is the disturbance coming from? And when he saw the disturb, saw the, uh, the, the storm, stormy wind and dust started clearing, he saw this fierce demoness. But as soon as he saw the demoness, what did he see? The first thing he saw, oh, she is a female. A Kshatriya is one who is Kshata Trayate Iti Kshatriya, one who protects those who are in danger, protects people from hurt. And one of the categories of people whom Kshatriya is supposed to protect is women. So now, as soon as Ram saw that, Ram started hesitating. Now Vishwamitra had also been a warrior before and he also had observed Ram clearly and because by Ram's arrangement he was meant to be his guide, immediately he understood what Ram was thinking and he told him that don't see her as a female, see her as a demoness. Here again we are coming to the same point, which category do we put in? If if a tiger suddenly attacks us in the forest. Now, whether what the gender of the tiger is, how much relevant it is, <laughs> isn't it? If a snake attacks us, how much relevant is the gender of the snake for us? If a tiger or a snake are attacking us, and at that time we think, what is the gender? Well, afterwards we won't be there to think anything else, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> So, for everything that we do, we have to place it in the right context. Now, when I talked earlier about intelligence and placing things in the right context, but here I want to, I, uh, my topic of speaking was that dealing with people intelligently. So, here we will take that same topic forward that intelligence means to place things in the most constructive context. That also means to place people in the most constructive context. If we are dealing with someone, we have to deal with them in the right context. So if this demon is, is coming to attack and at that time for Ram to put in the right context is, to put in, she is a demoness, her gender does not matter. The, uh, when uh, Vishwamitra spoke to him like this, Ram was turned into action, I started fighting, I started shooting arrows. But still, all the, she, she started using all her weapon, all her mystic powers and started showering stones and trees and illusory objects and Ram started dispelling all the illusions. And finally, Ram used his arrows to pierce her limbs. And she was so ferocious that she disappeared and suddenly started appearing and started, suddenly she would appear near Ram, suddenly she would go and appear in a giant form, suddenly she would be far away. And Ram was shooting arrows, but none of his arrows were hitting her. She was just too agile and too cunning. And also, although Ram had fought and injured her, but still Ram was holding himself back. 
he was not fighting wholeheartedly because still that thought was there in his mind he's a, he's a demon she's a female now when in the mahabharat also arjun was fighting against bhishma so arjun was fighting uh, well but not wholeheartedly he was thinking this is my this is my grandfather he told krishna that when i was a child i would sit on the i would come after playing from outside and i would sit on the lap of bhishma with my you know i would come and my feet would be dirty and i would soil his clothes and i would play with his beard and i would call him father father and he would fondle my hair and he would say child i am not your father i am the father of your father so he said how can i fight against such a person so now this is naturally one frame in which he could put his my grandfather but krishna told him right now you have to put him in the frame that he has chosen to fight against the kaur with the kauravas he has chosen to fight against dharma so because he was not able to put that put bhishma in that frame he couldn't fight wholeheartedly now bhishma on the other hand was a devotee and he when he took that promise that i am going to either kill the pandavas or make krishna intervene now he knew there was no way he was going to able to kill the pandavas so he took that vow simply because of his devotional excitement and to see how is krishna going to protect his devotees that like because he had this desire his desire was not to injure the pandavas his desire was to get krishna to act so he was fighting wholeheartedly and arjun was fighting half heartedly and arjun was getting overwhelmed so the same principle if we want to do something wholeheartedly we need to have the more proper framing for it so now tataka she was a demoness and she was outraged that somebody had come into her area challenged her and injured her maimed her so she was fighting ferociously holding nothing back i mean ram was fighting he was fight, he was fight, holding her back but he was not fighting wholeheartedly and as the fight went on and on and on in the distance the sun started going towards the horizon and as that started happening vishwamitra immediately goaded ram he said do not tarry he says if the night hap comes then the strength of the demons will increase and then overcoming her will become much more difficult now she has desecrated so many sacrifices she has devoured so many sages she has plundered so many innocent people's houses and villages and towns he says she must her life must end for the good of the world <coughs> when vishwamitra spoke so forcefully ram was jolted out and then ram shot an arrow and that arrow imbued with divine mantras the power of celestial sound is pierced with ataka and she screamed as the body arrow went straight to her body through her body and she fell and thus ram freed the world from this scourge and for him to be able to do this he had to see her not as a female but as a demon now this first lesson was something which ram applied throughout now we see again and again can you think of other examples where everybody saw a particular person particular way ram sign a different way yes yes excellent example vibhishana now when vibhishana came before the final war and at that time all the vanaras saw and the vanara said he is the brother he is a demon he is the brother of ravan how can we trust him these demons are very cunning he will be like a spy within us so everybody saw him as a as a demon because he was belonging to a demon's family but ram saw his heart ram saw that 
his heart was sincere you know, he could ram could see the sincerity of his heart on his face on the guilelessness of his face and he said if he has come to surrender to me he has come with a devotional mood i will accept him so he did not see him as a demon and that vision that perception proved to be extremely constructive in this ex- subsequent war vishan helped ram and lakshman the most strategic movements to find the weakness of kumbhakarna to find the weakness of indrajit to find the weakness of ravan and vishan fought valiantly in fact and ram he, he welcomed vishan and immediately with the sea water itself he coronated vishan as the next king of lanka and by this ram sent several messages he not only accepted vishan fully but he sent a message that he had no intention to either annex lanka or destroy lanka his enmity was not with the residents of lanka his enmity was only with ravan and he wanted to hand over the kingdom of lanka again to another rakshasa so his idea was not to take lanka as a part of his own kingdom but just to fight to gain sita back sometimes we may have to fight against someone but we don't have to be against someone there's a difference between the two fighting against someone and being against someone so ram fought against the rakshasas but he was not against the rakshasas we have a particular purpose to do and for that purpose if somebody comes in the way we have to fight against them but we are not against them per se that's why in the bhagavad gita also krishna tells arjun at one level to fight against the kauravas he says in 11.33 he says tasmat tamutishya yasho labasva jitva shatrun bhungshva rajyam samruddham maya yvaite nihata purvam eva nimitta matram bhavasa vyasachi he says arise fight your enemies are killed by my arrangement this is 11.33 and just uh, uh, this 22 verses later <coughs> when krishna is speaking the last verse of this 11th chapter there he says mat karma krun mat parmo mat bhakta sanga varjita nirvairah sarva bhuteshu yah samameti pandava he says nirvairah sarva bhuteshu have no animosity towards anyone so he's telling them to fight fight against them but don't have any enmity towards them don't bear any animosity towards them so here what is happening ram he communicated by his action that he fully accepted vibhishan and he had no enmity with the rakshasas per se it's only those rakshasas who stood in between him and sita he was going to fight against them not against everyone so we see ram also demonstrating this point that don't reduce people to their group identity but see the individual person and then place that individual in the most constructive context so this is the second point as illustrated through the ramayana any comments or questions about this okay so let me go to the last point then now how do we apply this to be intelligent in today's world we now live in a multicultural world there people from different cultures different countries different languages different backgrounds they all come together and they work together sometimes go to school or universities together our neighbors may also be from different backgrounds so now all of us we have our own perspectives and prejudices about different people so i was in the middle east just a few months ago and there in the middle east they have a lot of hostility with israel so there they were telling that now now this is not about a particular community but this is just how one community pursues another community he says that some people if there is a flood in the city now some people will ask okay is this flood good for our group or bad for our group flood is bad for everyone isn't it but if the group think becomes so excessive 
then we just can't see properly so when we reduce people to their group identity then what is happening we may not be using the most constructive categorization so now for now certainly considering group identity is required sometimes so if we meet someone and then we start thinking okay this person is a is an indian then maybe i can speak in an indian language if this person is a non indian is is a say australian then i'll speak in english so some amount of group identification is useful for functioning but within a group identity there are many different people of different mentalities every person within a group is a soul and each soul comes with its own karmic background from the past each soul comes with its own impressions from the present and each soul comes with his, his or her own personality her own character her own is is or her own character and nature and therefore each person is an individual so when shri prabhupad went to america at that time he was staying first in butler pennsylvania then he went to new york and he was first in upstate new york he was then he went to the bowery and people there told him that is not a place for anyone to stay it's a dangerous place people there are degraded you cannot live over there now the hippies are people who were rejected even by mainstream american society because there were very this a very peculiar phase in western history at that time the counter culture as it is called these people had everything that they wanted materially and still they were not satisfied so somehow they got the idea that we can take drugs so they had a particular drug at that time called lsd so lsd is a short form of a chemical but they had rechristened it as LS, anybody who takes lsd they join the league of spiritual discovery <laughs> so that was their idea at that time so when prabhupad went there people tell him these are degraded people these are dangerous people don't go there that was the frame in which people were putting but prabhupad saw they have some interest in krishna and he would say that every soul is ultimately a part of krishna every soul is devoted to krishna is potentially devoted to uh, krishna we just have to unleash that potential and because prabhupad put them in that frame he was able to spark he was fan the spark of devotion and that's how he was able to get everyone uh, not just people in america but people all over the world to come towards krishna to ultimately attain krishna so that's how we have the krishna conscious movement spread all over the world so when we have our particular frames in which we put people and that is just natural because we all uh, function at a practical level and for functioning we cannot analyze too much at each moment so what we need to do is when we function say now in our community we may say okay this person is a disciple of this guru this person is here this person is here this person is like this this person is like that this person is this religion this person of this country now all those are in some ways important to know but we have to see what is the most constructive context for what i am going to do right now what is the most constructive vision over here so if we have that attitude then we will be able to move forward say for example if we are trying to do some service together with someone and if we find that that person has a particular behavioral trait that we don't like maybe that person is not punctual or maybe that person is forgetful so naturally that will annoy us and we may associate that with someone else somebody who had been forgetful somebody had been uh, un- unpunctual and that person had irritated us got us into a lot of trouble and because of that we may start being negative towards this person also we, when we put people in a group what happens is e for each group we have a particular perception of that group and when we put people in that group we put them we assume that they have that kind of characteristics so rather than now because of that 
Now that person in the past whom we had been troubled with might have been very forgetful or maybe very irritable. This person may be only slightly like that. But we presume, we project our experience onto others. And then when we put people into a group, we start perceiving them accordingly. And then we make things even more difficult than they need to be. Because if we bring in some, some amount of resistance, some amount of negativity, some amount of hostility into the relationship, then people can't function. Then that person senses that and that person also keeps a distance from us and friction tends to increase. So when we are relating with people at that time, I'll conclude with two points now. First is that, that especially when we are forming a working relationship, if it's a close relationship, that principle applies all the more. But even if it's a working relationship, at that time, the first thing we naturally will, we just subconsciously do it. We people put people in some groups. This person is like this, this person is like this, this person is like this. And the grouping is, is at a functional level required. But we need to see each person as an individual. And say, that person is here, we are here. And our conceptions of that person are here. Now we have to see sometimes our conceptions help us to deal with that person better. And sometimes our conceptions come in the way of dealing with that person. So that we cannot be without conceptions, but we can become more aware of our conceptions. So if we become aware of our conceptions, then what happens is, okay, I was thinking about this person like this, and then this person did like this. Oh, I thought this person is forgetful, but this person remembered and brought this. Now what happens often, if we are more, if we are too attached to our conceptions, then what happens, even that person does something different, still we dismiss that as a one-time fluke. This is, uh, I was at a conference on science and spirituality. So we are talking about how within the system of science also, errors creep in. So one point it is said that, actually within science, as a philosopher of science, Robert Frost, he said that the theories we like, we call them as facts. And the facts we don't like, we call them as theories. <laughs> This is not necessary to minimize science. It's just the operational bias which everyone has. And even a professional profession that is considered as objective and as peer-reviewed as science, even there, these kind of biases come in. Then what to speak of in our normal human interactions? So when, our, when a person does something different from our conceptions, then either we can stay attached to our conception and say, this is just a one-time fluke. Or we can say, maybe my conception needs to be revised. So if we stay more attached to the conception than the actual person, then what happens? Then that person starts feeling, oh, actually, you are always going to see me negatively. And then after some time, people stop trying to improve, stop trying to change. And when people stop trying to change, then things become become frozen and then things start becoming cold, things start becoming uh, alienating. So, the, so we need to, we have our conceptions but don't give your conceptions more priority than the person's actual behavior. There's an American comedian, he was talking about a couple and he said that, you know, my wife and I, we live in separate rooms, we drive in separate cars, we eat our food on separate tables, we enter and leave our house from separate doors, we are doing everything possible to keep our marriage together. <laughs> now, if everything is separate, what is together over there, is it? It's just the structure is there, uh, do you live in the same house? So what has happened in such, where, why, why do such things come up? Because when people just, we put our conceptions over, the, there can be many causes of course, but when we have our particular conceptions, then those conceptions start becoming like walls between us and the other person. So we have our conceptions, they have their conceptions, and those conceptions come in the way of 
any kind of communications and does it just or oh, everything that a person does instead of breaking that wall it just becomes like one more brick in the wall one more brick in the wall and then communication almost breaks down so rather than that's the first point rather than being attached to our conceptions which are based on our the way we have framed the people in the past we let we we evaluate or we observe people's behavior objectively rather than just assuming or presuming that this is the way they are going to be or this is the way they are and a second point about conceptions is it is very helpful to try to interact with people who will challenge our conceptions so if i have a particular perspective about people then if i interact with people who are of widely different dispositions then what happens then my perspective gets challenged so you know i had gone for several interfaith conferences and in these interfaith conferences people from different faiths come along so in india there is always some tension between hindus and muslims and now that we projected at national level also there have been hostilities between india and pakistan rising so i had gone for an interfaith conference in in washington dc there are devotees do a uh, christian vaishnav dialogues and muslim vaishnav dialogues with various different religions they do that and so when i had gone there i was talking with people from different traditions in india even there's a lot of concern about conversions conversions to christianity happening and often these are done in un- underhanded ways where people either uh, people use some manipulative methods so i had this perceptions but when i went there i, I talked with several christians several muslims and i found it so thoughtful so broad minded so accepting acknowledging that yes there has been fanaticism from our side and this has happened that has happened and like almost everybody over there had put their guard down so that you could talk with each other and then i was talking with one senior devotee who had organized this program who had uh, who had asked me to come there and speak and he was telling me i told him it was such a so eye opening for me so he said that actually you know we need to see people according to not political or religious divisions but with philosophical vision and philosophical vision is there is sattva rajas and tamas there are three modes which are the modes goodness so good sattva rajas tamas goodness passion ignorance so in goodness people are thoughtful people look for the commonality rather than the diversity in passion people look people look primarily at the differences in ignorance people see exclusively the differences and make the differences into everything so yattu krutsnava dekasmin karye sakta mahetukam atvartha dalpam cha tatama samudartham yattu krutsnava dekasmin one thing into everything oh you worship god by this name you worship god by this name therefore we two are different and therefore to prove that my god is real your god has to be destroyed some people have this idea that my, our way is the only true way if you're not following my way you are going to go to hell <laughs> not only are you going to go to hell some fanatics say you are going to go to hell but we will help you get there faster <laughs> <laughs> so now what happens is there are there are people in every every group whether it be nation or religion or race or caste or whatever in every group there are people in sattva there are people in rajas and there are people in tamas in goodness passion and ignorance so this devotee is telling me that actually broadly we could say people in sattva are in are in are in are the moderates people who are in rajas are the proselytizers they just want to convert everyone to their religion and people in tamas are the complete intolerant they just don't want anyone else to exist so broadly speaking would divide so this is there are moderates from one tradition will find it easier to communicate with moderates from other tradition easier than communicating with extremists from their own tradition so sometimes we might just say this person is a, this this particular religion this particular group but within that group there can be a wide diversity 
so people in sattva from one group can communicate much easier with people in sattva from another with people in sattva from another group and people in sattva can't communicate with people in tamas very well because people think so differently so uh, if somebody is very serious you know this is not the time to make jokes then what is the time to make jokes <laughs> that is not the point <laughs> this is a rhetorical statement so some people just deliberately go take things in a different way and just they can't communicate so when we see that there is sattva rajas tamas and ultimately beyond that there is a soul who is individual and pure then we connect with people as their mood is presently and then we are able to function better with them so rather than just uh, rather than just labeling a person you belong to this group so you'll be like this no but we see is this person sattva in rajas and tamas and if a person is rajas then we engage them accordingly engage with them accordingly person is tamas then we understand that person will be short tempered this person will not be very re- responsible or hard working then we have to actually interact with them accordingly but rather than imposing a group designation on people we observe people as individuals see where they are and respond accordingly so prabhupada was like that once two disciples wrote to prabhupada and one both disciples had more or less same thing prabhupada i am the most fallen and the disciple said prabhupada i am i am extremely fallen and prabhupada wrote to the first disciple and he said actually you are the most nothing you are just insignificant now just do some practical service to krishna don't obsess over yourself so much and the other disciple prabhupada said i need many fallen souls like you to assist me in spreading krishna consciousness all over the world so <laughs> so both of them were saying the same thing but their their humility their expression of humility was in a different context so prabhupad saw the context and he said this is pseudo humility no, don't don't think i actually to think that i am the most fallen that's actually ego to think i am the most something some people say i am so fallen i am so impure that if i come to the temple the temple will become impure <laughs> so i will not come to the temple well don't be so proud of your impurity don't think your impurity is so great that it will make it will make a temple impure nothing can make the temple impure it's like saying you know i won't take a bath in the river because if i take a bath in the river the river will become impure all that is going to happen is you will stay unclean because of that isn't it so sometimes some humility something can seem like humility but it's not actually humility it's a distorted form of arrogance or ego so when prabhupad saw that it is expression of humility but prabhupad went beyond that expression to the intention and other devotee he was genuinely feeling that he is unworthy prabhupada said yes with this feeling if you have you will cooperate with the spiritual master and then the spiritual master can do wonderful things to you krishna can do wonderful things to you so when we understand this that each person is an individual and we deal with the people as individuals then we will find that our relationships can become more more personal so sometimes with some people we may say that our wavelength doesn't match Hmm? now it's it's actually we are all individuals so our wavelength can, doesn't match with some people but what happens is with some people we don't even try to match the wavelength it's like your wavelength is here your wavelength is there both of them talking past each other so if we understand if we treat people not based on conceptions or preconceptions but as individuals okay their wavelength is here my wavelength is here let's try to adjust as much as we can so i can't permanently change but at least for connecting and communicating let me adjust my wavelength a little bit then we will be able to communicate and when we communicate like that then we will be able to have deeper and stronger relationships and then we will be able to work together in our journey towards krishna so i'll summarize what i spoke i spoke on the t- t- topic of how to be intelligent in our relationships i spoke three points first was that intelligence means to place things in the most constructive context the second point was ram learned through his first war to place tataka in the context of in the category of not a female but as a demoness as a demon and lastly we learn to uh, not bring our con- impose our conceptions on people but let people's behavior and actual i real actions decide how we function with them so the in the first point i explained how when people get depressed the smallest of incident 
they draw the biggest of meanings i drop a glass of water therefore i am worthless i can't do anything in my life so at a functional level we all could place the same say a picture of this event could be at different levels of framing similarly each event we can intellectually place in different contexts so we have to see which is the most constructive if i am feeling hot right now uh, okay i just need some some the, the um, fan it is not that oh australian temperature is very bad for me so we have to place things in the most constructive context and then in the ramayan i told the incident of ram confronting sadaka and he saw that she is a female a female is not meant to be attacked but if a if a tiger is attacking or a snake is attacking we won't look at the gender we we'll look at the intention the mentality the disposition so similarly vishwamitra told him that don't look at her as look at tadaka as a female look at her as a demoness so then till he got that point in he was fight not fighting initially and fighting half heartedly but eventually he fought whole heartedly and that principle he applied throughout the ramayana even later everyone else saw vibhishan as a demon but he saw vibhishan as a devotee as one who is surrendering to him so intelligence means that when we relate with people we place them in the most constructive category so and i concluded the third point was that about relationships yeah, we all have our own preconceptions and prejudices about people and based on that those those come between us and them when we interact and when people behave differently either we can stay attached to their preju- our prejudices and say this is a one off fluke or we can say maybe my preconceptions don't apply over here so if if two people come with their preconceptions and they keep reinforcing the preconceptions through all the interactions then it's like a wall that is formed between the two and then the relationships just can't move forward so 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 i talk about two broad principles for breaking down this wall of prejudices first is that we let people we deal with people as they are not based on the pre- if they if they behave in a way different from our preconceptions <laughs> we observe it and accept it not just try to dismiss it based on our preconception and secondly we interact with people who challenge our preconceptions so we might think people of a particular group are are short tempered or intolerant or manipulative or whatever but if we, we in every group there is sattva rajas and tamas so moderates of one tradition can connect better with moderates of other tradition than with extremists of their own tradition and when we learn to treat people as individuals not as simply members of a particular group prabhu pad did not see the hippies as degraded american youth he saw them as souls with a spark of interest in krishna and therefore he could fan that spark so when we learn to place people place our relationship in a constructive context our interactions can become more meaningful and the relationships can become deeper thank you very much hare krishna any questions or comments yes please Hare Krishna you talked yeah. about um, intelligence and knowledge yeah um the third thing is all right so many forms of wisdom so is wisdom different than knowledge and intelligence and if it is different what role does it play to put the things into the constructive context or not make perceptions or to make perceptions Mm. so is wisdom is wisdom different from knowledge and intelligence no wisdom if you see broadly speaking if you translate in uh, sanskrit it would be buddhi itself so generally when you talk about wisdom wisdom is more like applied knowledge mm. and knowledge itself we could say is, or we could say data that is raw or unprocessed so wisdom would be the same as intelligence broadly speaking intelligence is also translated as buddhi wisdom is also translated as buddhi so i don't i not seen any other any third word apart from this there is a word vigyan gyan vigyan tatva kshasis prabhu patan says vigyan as realized knowledge so you could say realized knowledge how do you know knowledge is realized by action so in that sense that is that is there is also buddhi so let's say it's, it's buddhi means wisdom okay so and wisdom 
is what as i said if we get realizations if we interact with reality as it is that's when we learn okay this is how things are to be done. this is how things are not to be done otherwise we are just taking a pre theoretical conception and imposing it on situations that doesn't work so well okay thank you yes oh you probably have covered this but um <coughs> the process of sadhana bhakti we are asked to discriminate discriminate between senior devotees peers and neophyte devotees so when we start discriminating what happens we start judging people and they become judgmental mm -hmm. so we extend that oh this person doesn't come temple often therefore he's not a good devotee so these things go in our mind we start judging people um because we try to discriminate between senior and neophyte and we start judging people and that judgment mm -hmm. can lead us into catastrophic situation so how do we discriminate by not judging people hmm uh, good question so how can we discriminate without judging there is a difference in other word discrimination itself has a, a slightly negative connotation today in today's world we have gender discrimination or racial discrimination uh, but the word discrimination simply means the capacity to make distinctions mm -hmm. and uh, say if somebody is a good cook or a connoisseur of food they can make out this is well cooked this is not so well cooked and that capacity to discriminate is required if somebody has to cook well so in that sense discrimination itself is not bad so in terms of relationships and when you talk about discriminating essentially discrimination as it is talked about is for our good in terms of what whose association is favorable for me and whose association is unfavorable for me anukulya se sankalpa pratikulya se varjanam but when we talk about judging judging means we put ourselves in a superior position i said this is this person is bad and this person is good so the difference is between what is good and bad and what is good and bad for me so discriminating means we focus on what is favorable for me what is unfavorable for me now we don't know what is going on between a soul and krishna now many of prabhupada's god brothers thought that prabhupada didn't come so often to gaudiyam but prabhupada was not a full time member of gaudiyam so he said why is he so entangled in worldly life if he has so much de service devotion he has so much service attitude he just come and join us so they thought that he was not a very advanced devotee so <laughs> but bhakti sansu thakur saw and he said in his time he will do everything so therefore from a functional perspective we do need to we need to discriminate but we don't have to judge judging happens when we put ourselves in a superior position and another person in a uh, in a inferior position it's a, okay let me put it another way that uh, there is a person there is a person's behavior or actions and there is we so it's if a person is infected by a particular disease say it's a contagious disease mm -hmm. i had about 15 years ago i had a severe dose of tb so for almost 4 months i had become a jain sadhu <laughs> covering my face with a mask so that just to prevent people from getting those germs so now even if i would give class i would with the mouth would be covered in the through that i would speak now now that is just functionally required so so when if somebody is sick you don't judge those people you know that they're not bad people because they're sick but if if somebody is sick with a contagious disease we cannot go close to them because we will get sickness so that is discrimination where we we see the person is here the disease is here and we see the person is different from this disease the person is not bad but but my associating with them without any borders without any safeguards will be bad for me so we have to see from that perspective that everybody has some conditioning everybody has some sickness and we all need to do what it takes to recover and gain our spiritual health so some of people as the association of some people is favorable for us the association of some is not favorable so if some association is not favorable then we keep a distance and we don't have to disrespect or offend that person we don't have to label them and broadcast their negativity to everyone if we are responsible for some people then we may have to tell them in a respectful way now don't keep a keep a distance from this person whatever but you don't have to go about judging so judging essentially means we put 
permanent unchangeable label on the person not on their particular behavior and not on our effect not on the effect of that on us so as long as we're in this this zone okay this this person's behavior has a negative effect on me or this person's behavior is not favorable for me then we are in a safe zone that is discrimination but once we put the label on that person itself then that's where we become judgmental does that answer your question okay any other questions yes about like if a person is repeating same thing again and again and again and again and then how can we like obviously have to label them okay so like, if somebody makes the same thing again and again shouldn't we label them see when i said permanent labels there could be a label which might apply for this lifetime but still it doesn't apply for the soul so sometimes some conditioning is such that some people can't change that conditioning or some people don't even want to change that conditioning mm. so in that case we may have to decide that uh, 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 i was at a mediation doing for two devotees and he says no i respect you very much but i will associate with you when both of us go back to the spiritual world <laughs> <laughs> no i don't recommend that <laughs> but is it that we two are so different So, Prabhupada said, "Our love for sh- uh, should be shown by how we cooperate." Now, one way of cooperating is cooperate. You operate here, I'll operate here, and we'll cooperate. At least, you know, I, I don't speak bad about you, and you don't speak bad about me. So, Prabhupada's the the Krishna conscious movement is big enough that is sometimes people are such that you know, some people just can't get along with some people. If that is happening, then it is best to keep a distance but not spoil the relationship so different relationships work best at different distances sometimes some people you know, we want to be very close to them but they just keep a distance then we can't really have a very close relationship with them but if from a distance you know, we smile at them they smile at us and the relationship is reasonable with some people we can become close with some, with some people we just can't become close So, if somebody has behave, somebody repeatedly behaves in a way that troubles us, or that leads to trouble for everyone else also, then a distance has to be kept. Either we have to keep a distance from them, or they have to be kept at a distance from the community, whatever, depending on the logistics of the situation. But we see it as okay. The some soul, uh, every soul has a conditioning, and some conditionings may last for a whole life, may may last for a whole lifetime. am i audible behind okay so therefore just keep a distance uh, but don't lose uh, don't uh, don't uh, don't uh, condemn the person i have a whole seminar on forgiveness uh, but here here is a simple point i'll make it that there is a difference between forgiving and trusting if somebody has repeatedly made a mistake we told somebody you know, we have distributed these books and now can you take this um, case there is lakshmi and deposit in the temple and they take the lakshmi and they lose the lakshmi now next time now we may forgive them for that but next time if you are lakshmi should we give it to them no we should not so there is forgiving is for the past trusting is for the future forgiveness can be given but trust has to be earned and if some people this behavior is not trustworthy then we cannot we can we cannot give them our trust that would be naive and that would be foolish so therefore we may have to keep a distance from some people based on their repeated behavior in a particular way but we don't have to hold negativity towards them and spoil the relationship does that address your question yes. okay. thank you yes very good about preconception and prejudice hmm very basic example preconception and prejudice is between mother and child mother always thinks for the child since the birth and uh, will uh, do things for the child and it will be in interest of the child whether schooling or whatever 
and uh, if mother is not pre uh, preconcepting about the child, what child will be for the society or community? In what sense are you using the word preconception? Can you explain? Uh, what you say that we sometimes judge people uh, and especially on our subordinates or we think that way. Same thing okay, in okay. the I child and mother relationship. I think I got your question now. Yeah. Because <laughs> if a mother is uh, with a child from the light from the birth and the mother has to have certain conceptions okay my child is like this child has this nature child tends to do like this and only based on that the mother can function properly and maybe guard the child or guide the child so can it be possible to be free from preconceptions no as i said if conceptions or preconceptions whatever word you want to use that for a functional basis are required mm. say we all interact in a particular community right and there is a certain structure of behavior that is there say all of you are sitting right now now all of you i would say are reasonably confident that suddenly the person next to you is not going to give you a punch in your face <laughs> a theoretically possible it's possible isn't it but overall with <laughs> it won't happen so whenever we we have some social interactions now there is a certain structure of behavior that is ex expected and we all learn to fit into that mm -hmm. say when some new people come when they come to a temple they see everybody doing something in general people try to fit into the particular setting that they are in mm -hmm. so once i was in the temple and uh, in pune and there was some french woman had come so she would look around the temple i showed her around and then there was charanamrut so i told her i didn't know french and she didn't know english so i took the charanamrut and i did like this now i had already taken the charanamrut so i just said we'll pour it and you do this so and then we do like this so she took the charanamrut did like this and poured the charanamrut on her whole head <laughs> she didn't understand so what happened was that she just imitated so what happens i gave this example to illustrate this point that actually now based on my hand gestures now i just presume you have to drink it that's obvious we don't just touch it like this and do it like that so we all have certain preconceptions and that's how we behave mm. now i thought she will obviously understand but she didn't so our preconceptions at a functional level are essential like say the one functional level is that okay you cannot communicate language so communicate by gestures but what the gesture means i presume that but that she didn't get it at that time so therefore when we have certain preconceptions that's fine for a functional level they are required but when they don't serve the purpose that is when we should be ready to open them be ready to uh, revise them at least revisit them if not revise them so we can't function without having certain uh, certain level of assumptions you could say the word preconception usually has a negative connotation conception has a more neutral connotation but it's more of assumptions so if i come here to speak i will assume that i want to speak in english now but if i find everybody is comfortable in hindi and everybody wants hindi i might speak in hindi but every interaction there are certain functional basic level of assumptions that are there like you know nobody will punch me while i'm sitting in this class that's assumption so parents also have to have certain assumptions about the children and those assumptions are not just blind assumptions they are based on past experiences so at the same time the assumptions should not become like static labels say uh, that means uh, a, a child might be not doing the homework mother knows the child doesn't do the homework so i have to push the child do the homework do the homework do the homework and then the child does it that's fine but that doesn't mean the child is always going to be like that tomorrow if the child grows matures and becomes responsible then the mother doesn't have to necessarily the child has grown up and still the mother keeps imposing that no do this do this i have done it i am going to do it don't you don't have to tell me about it mm -hmm. is it so there is a there is a time when a particular sometimes some labels outlive their utility 
and that's when we need to be able to uh, put them aside. So there's no doubt that certain amount of the label has a negative word again, negative connotation. But there are fun for functional purposes, certain assumptions are required. But when reality differs from our assumptions, we should be able to take in the reality and then revise the assumptions that requ as required. That's what I was focusing on. But that is your question. Thank you. Yes, please. Yes. Before putting my question, I would like to thank you. I have been immensely following your website and it has helped me in lots of cases. Uh, it was very, the website is very nice and very informative, very technical and it helped uh, to resolve other people's questions who were very difficult to convince and I can say like two people who were in suicidal thoughts were also able to come out. I would like to thank you for that uh, good content in your okay. website. Happy to be of service. Thank you for sharing this. So, regarding the question, so you were saying you we need to take things in the right concept and the most appropriate concept. So, when we need to uh, look through that particular uh, context, so there are two things: are material and spiritual. One each contradicts to the each other. So, once we may think from spiritual angle, it may be definitely wrong in a material context. And when we see from material, it will be wrong from spiritual mm -hmm. context. So, what guidelines do we take forward, or how do I verify whether I am doing a right country? Do, today, I think in one way, mm. it's right for me for today. But how do I look up to and how do I verify whether this is a right country? Yeah, that's a question. You may not have the high intelligence all the time. That's true. So, how do we know whether we are putting things in the right context? Because sometimes material context and spiritual context may be opposite also. Yes, see basically as I said, the most <coughs> constructive context is that which enables us to function in the best possible way. So sometimes the material spiritual categorization is is too broad to be helpful. So I prefer to say it as what is material and what is spiritual. Ultimately, spiritual is the attitude of service. Material is the attitude of exploitation, of self-centeredness. So, if I am interacting with someone, even if that person be a materialist, now if I have an attitude of service, okay, how, how best can I help this person? How best can I, maybe if I am interacting in a devotional context, how can I help this person take one step towards Krishna? So, in general, material consciousness means that as soon as we see a person, we think, what can this person do for me? Spiritual consciousness means as soon as we see a person, we think, what can I do for this person? So, it is more service centered. And if we have this functional and uh, this understanding, service centered, then what might normally seem as material might also be spiritual. Because if something is simply a material interaction, but it furthers our service to Krishna, or it creates a favorable atmosphere for the service to Krishna, then it is, it is, it is a favorable. It can also be called broadly spiritual. Now, having said that, with respect to our decisions, in general, this is, uh, uh, you know, our opinions. We all have opinions, we all have conceptions, we all have assumptions. It is good to hold our opinions lightly, not tightly. That means, okay, this is, <laughs> yeah, this is my understanding. And, this is the understanding. We all need some understanding to function. We can't live without any understanding. But sometimes a reality surprises us. So, when in, when we ch when we choose a particular frame to pers pursue something, mm. then if that frame if that frame helps us move forward, that's positive. If it is not, then we need to change the framing. So, if like it happened that when the devotees first time did a Rathyatra in London. Now the devotees had done a big Rathyatra in U U big Rathyatra in the USA and the devotees went to London and decided to do a bigger cart. But somehow they kept the wheels and the structure of the same size. And then when the Rathyatra was about to start, it, it went for a short distance and the Rath tumbled. And the devotees had done a lot of publicity, it was, like, it was a fiasco. And the devotees uh, uh, wrote to Prabhupada and says, Prabhupada, did this Rath collapse because of our poor devotion? 
And Prabhupada replied, no, it collapsed because of your poor engineering. <laughs> so now in that case, there is no need to get into this whole, oh, because we are not pure, we are not sincere devotees, that's why it fell down. Well, if you are, whether you are sincere devotees or not sincere devotees, the Rath has to be engineered properly, isn't it? So, Prabhupada framed it in a very practical context. And the next time you are there is the Rath Yatra and worked out very well. So, we can say that in the Mahabharata it is said that there are three broad frames or three broad factors for considering right and wrong action. It is intent, content and consequence. Why am I doing this? Intention is important. Then content, what exactly am I doing? And then consequence, okay, what is the result of doing this? So, say sometimes a doctor gives a prescribes a particular medicine. Now, technically speaking, that medicine for one disease, you can have 10 appropriate medicines, 10 medicines which, which are okay. But sometimes that patient might have some background, some background case history because if one, because of which one medicine turns out, turns out to be contraindicative and it has a contrary effect. Then what happens? Or oh, the consequence is this? Oh, then this was not the best medicine. Change the medicine. So sometimes we have a book which tells us the content. For this disease, you take this. But then the consequence tells us it doesn't work. So we may have to revise based on the consequence. And especially with respect to interpersonal dealings, intention is also important. Sometimes we have an intention, somebody is doing something wrong and our intention is to help them do the right thing and so we give them some constructive feedback. But although our intention is good, if our manner is not very good, if our way of speaking is not very good, then that might alienate people. Or sometimes even we speak also gently, but still that the person takes it offense, takes it, takes, feels offended by that. Next time he said, maybe, maybe I am not the right person to do this. So intent, intent content and consequence if broadly we see, okay, if I am putting this in this frame, why am I putting it like this? Hmm? Is it because I like this person and that's why I am always giving them the benefit of doubt? Is it because I dislike this person so I always keep doubting this person? So we, we see somebody eating a lot. If we, if we don't like that person, we will say, such a glutton. And if you like that person, must have been hungry. <laughs> <laughs> now it is the same activity <laughs> but we can put it into different frames <laughs> so we have to look at our intent also okay mm -hmm. answer your question yes thank you any last question so thank you very much shri prabhupada ki gaur bhakta vrind ki Hi, Gaur Premanande. Hi, Gaur.